and uh, <coughs> we are privileged uh, for his presence uh, to be here basically for two reasons uh, <coughs> he is from um, uh, india one reason and second is we have an ongoing collaborative project on developing uh, industrially valuable uh, byproducts uh, from the biomass of brown meat rib sorghums that uh, contains low lignin okay you know the major impediment in uh, commercializing the technology from lignocellulosic biomass to biofuels is high pre treatment costs uh, due to high involvement of uh, enzymes uh, during pre treatment so this uh, novel set of mutants uh, are expected to reduce uh, the pre treatment costs uh, thereby making the entire lignocellulosic uh, uh conversion process uh, into a commercially viable and uh, ecologically sustainable chain so at this moment i would like to draw rather than dwelling so much on the personal details or uh, bio data of uh, dr wadlani to talk uh, on advanced biofuels from biomass carbohydrates to hydrocarbons now the floor is to dr wadlani Uh, thank you, Dr. Sinuas, for your introduction. I'll turn the light off. Uh, good afternoon. And greetings from Kansas. A great pleasure to be here. I heard a lot of what Chris said. It's my first visit, and I'm truly impressed with the facilities and the people I've met so far. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, for the next half an hour or so, maybe a little bit more, uh, I'll give a little uh, uh, overview of uh, what we are doing in our lab, uh, and also a little bit of introduction on the bioconversion side. And finally, I'll wrap up with some uh, ongoing projects we are under, undergoing in our laboratory. Uh, again, I'm Praveen V. Vadlani, and uh, I'm, at, I'm from Kansas State University. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Bioprocessing and Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, along with being uh, at the Department of Grain Science, I also work very closely with Department of Agronomy, uh, Department of Chemical Engineering. I have an uh, ancillary appointment with Chem Chemical Engineering Department, so this is briefly who I am. So uh, without much further ado, I'll just keep going on uh, what I want to talk today. Uh, basically, uh, this whole thing kind of boils down to what is known as uh, the emergence of bio-based economy. So if you look at this slide, uh, the top portion kind of tells you what happened in the last century. Uh, more to do with right after the, uh, the World War II, uh, when petroleum emerged as one of the principal feedstock, kind of driver for all the uh, things happening in the world. So the conversion of uh, this oil, refining, and then uh, converting that into all these useful products. So basically, we use chemistry and uh, chemical engineering to do this. Now, can we do the same thing? Uh, yes, we can. There are some renewable materials uh, which we can utilize, and those come from crops. And uh, we know all these uh, centuries, crops have been raised only for uh, food purpose, food and feed purpose. But the same feedstock, uh, if you produce enough of them, and those non edible portion of these crops, you can convert them into chemicals. So only the science is a little different, uh, been working hard on that. It involves not just biology, uh, but also chemistry and engineering. So that is what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, the brief overview, why, why we're doing into this bio base. So if you look at this, uh, it's an interesting slide. Uh, the world energy consumption uh, is going to increase another 40 to 50 percent from 2010. By the time you look 40 years ahead into the future, and most of the new energy demand is going to come from the non-OECD countries. And OECD stands for, uh, it's an organization which was set up in 60s, basically rich countries club. And uh, so they kind of uh, used to group together and share technologies and all that. So OECD is a developed countries. And then if you see the non-OECD are primarily India and China. And then maybe some other smaller countries. So that's where the major demand is going to be. So this uh, energy, the demand is both because of population rise, but also because of needs. Like, you know, we're getting more and more closer into the same lifestyle as the rest of the world. So that's going to draw more and more energy. So are, are we getting anywhere close to that? So we'll talk about that. So this is, uh, again, I'm going to talk today more about from a U.S. perspective, because that's where I'm from right now. Uh, if you look at the way U.S. consumes energy, there's quadrillion of BTU, British Thermal Unit, and quadrillion is 10 to the power of 15. So that's the amount of energy uh, which they need. So the U.S. consumes about 100 uh, quads. And uh, it's kind of stays steady. And uh, primarily, it's, uh, it's utilized in all four different segments. But the main drivers are going to be these other countries. So that's where the energy is going to be utilized. 
But if you see, how is this energy demand going to be met? What is the mix? So the traditional sources for meeting this demand is petroleum, uh, coal, natural gas. So these still are going to be the primary drivers. They're not going to go away. So all these talks about the biomass-based energy is going to totally replace. It's not going to happen. Uh, as you can see in this slide, the renewable portions is just a small portion, about 11 percent. And in that 11 percent, 4 percent is uh, the liquid biofuels. And uh, though it's a very small sliver of the total energy portfolio, but uh, it's going to assume significance because uh, of the potential what it can bring to the table. So I'll focus more on that today in my talk. But uh, this is the landscape. This is how it's going to be. And it may change even more because of the recent uh, advances in other technologies like fracking and uh, deep sea drilling and shale oil. So if that happens, then the U.S. is going to become a net exporter of energy than being a net importer. So we know what that effect will have on the environment and other issues. But this liquid fuels is uh, of my interest. <coughs> so again, this is slide I just wanted to give in because most of you here are from agronomy background. So the land stage is another critical issue. So the way if you look at it, the uh, renewable portion of this biofuels, like global biofuels, from 2010 to 2050, if you look at it, <coughs> most of the demand is going to come from the advanced biofuels. I mean, here it's written as biodiesel advanced and biojet. I mean, these are the two portions. But the cellulosic uh, conventional ethanol and conventional cellulosic ethanol is kind of saturated. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute, but the uh, real advances are going to be in this, or are known as a drop-in jet fuels, drop-in uh, transportation fuels. And that's where the demand is. And uh, again, the land use, I'm not an expert in that, so I won't go more into it, but again, Simple convention says that if you want to meet this demand, then uh, the land use also will go up if you want to use the current model for generating energy. Uh, if you look at the U.S. liquid fuels, generally how is it done right now? So the traditional method is the petroleum thing. You take the crude, you crack it or distill it, and then you make your refined products. And from these refined products, you can pretty much make everything, plastics, chemicals. And that's what I was taught in my undergrad, chemical engineering. And then you also have non-fossil fuels, I mean non-petroleum fossil fuels, natural gas and other things. So you can also take it that and make these fuels. And the biofuel sector, uh, the traditional what is there already are the dry and wet mill ethanol uh, plants. And then you use enzymes or you can directly take the biomass and gasify it, what is known as thermochemical method. And then you can make these fuels and then you end up with some solids. The solids can be burned for biopower or things like that. And uh, this leads to the same chemicals in petrol. So this is uh, where the integration step goes. Uh, Department for Energy and uh, EPA, U.S. has come up with this renewable fuel standard. This is mandated by the Congress, so this is what they want uh, the, the levels to be, the fuels level. So if you look at it, like, uh, again, it's a busy slide, I don't want to go. So as we move forward, maybe a little bit uh, outdated because renewable fuel standard 2 has come and they've um, like kind of re-engineered these uh, targets, and so we may have fresh targets, but I just want to let you know that the corn ethanol will meet about 15 billion gallons. So that's a traditional grain to ethanol plant. And the cellulosic, about another 16. And uh, by 2012 or 2013, we should have had at least two or, two or three billion gallons of the cellulosic ethanol. But we are now close to that. So that has been the biggest uh, challenge so far. And I'll talk a little bit about what the cellulosic ethanol is. And then the other advanced biofuels and other biodiesels. Anticipated that that will take care of the rest of the mandate. But uh, this will get... Uh, recalibrated because we are not able to meet some of these uh, uh, requirements. But uh, this is what the mandate is, but this is where uh, the science is. What do you mean by the renewable feedstock? So as you can see in this slide, this is basically all the crops, the cereal crops, uh, which are staple in some part of the world. For example, rice is predominant in this part, rice and wheat in India. Uh, if you go down to uh, U.S. and other places, it's uh, corn or maize, as you call it, wheat and uh, topiac and cane and other things. So all these crops are primarily for food consumption. So the only reason why we're interested as, uh, from a bioconversion point of view is because it has got starch. The storage polymer, uh, which you can convert into simple sugars, and that can be fermented and made into fuels, chemicals, and all that. So the only thing which is non-food is the biomass. So uh, conventional sense makes, why mess with what you want to eat? Go for non-food source. Uh, so that's why the biomass is the biggest uh, renewable feedstock, which you should consider because it's a non-food source. 
but then the chemistry involved in the biomass is different, so there are technical challenges because of how you use this biomass. So again, this is a little predated slide. It was done based out of parallax study in 2005, basically telling how much biomass is available. Uh, they estimated close to a billion tons. So uh, this number now has been readjusted. They say it's a little less than a billion tons. But what is important is where that mix comes from. So we have all the crop residues, and then you have the perennial crops, and then you also have uh, solid waste and all this. So it's a whole mix of this. So uh, when you develop any conversion technology for making products, it's very important to consider that the feedstock which you're going to get is not going to be uniform. It's going to be varied. It's going to be of different compositions. That's why you ought to take that into your uh, account. I mean, that you ought to account that into your calculations and into your conversion. So that's a very, very important point. And then the projects which we're going to work with, uh, Dr. Srinivas will kind of consider that because we're going to look into the compositional changes and how it affects. Well, let me come back to Kansas, and uh, as you all may be knowing, Kansas is right in the middle of U.S. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a more, the centrist you can get into and still be in U.S., so that's what Kansas is. Uh, the whole state population is about 2 or 3 million, so a city of Hyderabad will have four times of that, I would say. Uh, that's, that's the town population, but it's primarily agriculture-driven uh, state, and uh, wheat is the, the major crop. Uh, then, uh, then comes sorghum, uh, soybean, and corn. But it's the number one wheat producing state. And then along with agriculture, and it's also a little bit of an deviation here, they're also good in aviation. The aviation industry like Boeing and other companies are based in Wichita and Kansas. And then they also have oil and gas, the, the traditional fossil fuels, and then the service sector. So this is what uh, the state of Kansas is. So I work uh, at Kansas State University. And in the North Campus, which Dr. Srinivas has visited, we have developed this value-added program. So this entire complex is meant for uh, finding value for agriculture products. So I work in a two-story building, and then we have the flour mill, and then right next to that, a new feed mill has come. So this is processing of grain for food and feed applications. And then the bio, uh, bioprocessing and industrial value program, that's where I work for. And the primary goal of this uh, program is to find value. So we use bioprocessing technology and utilize this ag-based uh, residues and materials and uh, not only look into the food and feed, but finding industrial use products. So that's my primary goal. And I was hired by Texas A, I mean by Kansas State University as a faculty and also as a director of this program. So th this is what I do. So our, this lab situated in this building was set up in 2007. This is a brief slide of some of my students working uh, in the lab. But our research areas are primarily driven by advanced biofuels. And this is other than cellulosic ethanol. Uh, that's still we're working on it because uh, there's still a lot of technical challenges it needs to be met before we can consider this to be a mature technology. And other fuels like uh, butyrendol and free fatty acids and other things, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But that's what we are focused on. Ethanol from grain is done, but we still do some experiments just to validate some seeds and uh, some other raw materials. But as far as the technology for conversion is already known. We also do work on chemicals because uh, that's another big driver. And in fact, uh, with my limited wisdom, I can say that the biggest driver for this bio-based economy is going to come from chemicals, not just fuels. Because fuels, you have to compete with this uh, crude oil-based fuel. The margins are very low, so it's very difficult. And, uh, so the price fluctuations, so it's difficult to meet that uh, the price uh, mix. So chemicals, you have good margins, so it's a good industry to get into it. And core product utilization, this is another bigger uh, sector. Uh, most of the time, we are so focused on the main product that we lose our focus on some of these other value-added products which can come along. So in our lab, we try to make sure that we find uses with every, car every carbon molecule. In the sense, every component of the, uh, the raw material we are processing, we try to see if we can find some uses with that. And then uh, recently, we started getting more into the science side, the metabolic and the biomolecular engineering, basically trying to tinker with a microbe see if we can uh, introduce or uh, delete some pathways so we can make targeted products, uh, again, at high yield and concentrations. So this will help us to make value-added products. So that's the primary focus. I mean, I have two or three students just working on that particular topic. <coughs> I'll walk you a little bit through the ethanol industry. I mean, what's happening? Because that's what is the biofuel. The one commercial biofuel is corn to, I mean, grain to ethanol, but in the U.S. it's primarily corn. So I can see the historical feedstocks is basically corn, 
but they use some sorghum too. Again, in Kansas, we have two or three plants which can process sorghum and make ethanol. It's the same technology because you're after the starch, so you can do that. So there are about 200 ethanol plants, and at any given time, uh, that's a number. There's still some new industries coming up, but uh, the important thing I want to highlight here is uh, in 20, in 2000, they were making only close to 1.6 billion gallons. So that's how it was. I, I went to US in 98, and that's around the time, that's what they're doing. In the first decade of this century, that's when the real boom came. And most of the boom was in uh, corn ethanol process. So it went from 1.6 to 30 billion gallons. So they kind of hit the saturation. They're ahead of what the mandates are required. And it's a whooping 800% increase in that. And so this industry is mature on ethanol. So everything what needs to be done is, is done. There's no more new things to learn other, other than advances in processing technology. But otherwise, the whole processing is, is done. So if you look at it, basically, these plants are situated in the central part of the U.S. And the uh, main reason is that's where the crops are. So unlike some of the uh, crude oil processing industry, they're always in the Gulf Coast because they need the water. So they're either in the Texas or Louisiana, that part. But the uh, corn processing plants or the ethanol plants are mostly in the Midwest region. So this is Kansas here, right now. So in Kansas, we have about eight to nine plants at any given time. But most of the corn and grain ethanol plants are in Iowa, uh, lower part of Minnesota, and some parts of Illinois and other places. So this is the corn to ethanol. <coughs> so the processing step is very simple. It's very clear and done. So you break down the starch present in the grain, plus you grind them. So you take the starch, ferment, get the sugars, ferment the sugars, and you separate the ethanol, purify the ethanol. So it's a, it's a standard procedure. So a typical processing uh, plant will look like this. I mean, I'm not going to walk you through all this step, but basically quickly walking through it. So it's the corn gets milled into a certain particle size, mixed into slurry because enzymes have to act, so they need some water. So you cook them so the steam, the starch is gelatinized, and you add the second enzyme, and then you put it into the fermenter. So it can be batch or continuous. Then what you get is what is known as a beer, which is about 16% ethanol on a uh, weight by weight basis. Then you distill that and you get about 190 proof, and that's about 95%. Uh, because of azeotrope formation, you can't take other water off. So you see them through this uh, dehydration step, molecular sieve. Essentially, these are sieves like any other sieves are. And the water and ethanol is separated. And you get 200 proof, that means 100% ethanol, uh, and address absolute alcohol. And you denature that by adding a little bit of gasoline so that you get into the fuel market, not the consumption market. Otherwise, you end up paying taxes and all that. So you denature that, and that is what is carved. So that's how the ethanol is made. And at the bottom of this distillation plant, so you centrifuge, and then the thin silage is uh, evaporated into a syrup, and the syrup is added back into dryer, where the solids from here is added to dryer. And together, this is called distillers dried grain, very valuable feed product. So this is used uh, for livestock and other industry. So just a simple mass balance, as we call it. You take about uh, 25 kilogram. Why it's 25 kilogram is they use a unit bushel. Bushels of corn in, in U.S. So one bushel is about 56 pounds. So in metric units, it's 25 kilograms. So when you convert that into starch, you get about 15, and then it goes up because water gets absorbed. It's depolymerization. And then about one third of that goes for ethanol. One third goes, for, uh, goes off as CO2. And then another one third goes off as uh, animal feed product. So this is the ethanol industry. And uh, whereas you come to the lignocellulose, I mean, that's something which uh, there's so much of interest all over the world. I've been to four different countries, and everywhere they're uh, working really hard and trying to see how best they can put value to this lignocellulose biomass. The only thing is, like, it's a complex molecule. Nature designed this uh, lignocellulose biomass to provide structure to the plants. And the very reason why uh, life moved from aquatic region to the terrestrial region is because of the presence of lignin. It's a wonderful polymer. Uh, nature designed it so that it can give structural support and also to transpire water. So that's why we have these large trees which go about 50 to 100 feet above ground. So the lignin provides the right support and uh, uh, platform so the water can go. And that's how this has been designed. So this is a structural polymer. And we're trying to crack this because we're interested in this cellulose and MS cellulose. And this contains the sugars, the six carbon and the five carbon sugars, which we can ferment and make fuels. So, thank you. but uh, it's not an easy story because, like I said earlier, the nature of the way it's designed is your fibers are hidden inside, and then you have this um, polypropanide unit made of uh, lignin made of polypropanide unit, which provides this protective sheet around it. So you have to break the seal, and that's what we do the pretreatment. 
And there's a reason why it's present because it also is antimicrobial and that's one of the reasons why the plants are existing. Otherwise, they would have been wiped out by this fungal and microbial attack. So this lignin has to be broken. So that's what we do in a pretreatment process. We get to this uh, fibers and then we convert that. So that's what the cellulosic uh, ethanol process is. Now I have a couple of uh, examples from our lab, what we have done with this different biomass. Because, uh, since you all are with that background, so I want to talk a little bit about what actually happens when you use this different biomass. So we tried various kinds. So we used the forage sorghum as it's called there, uh, two different grasses and then we use wheat straw as a control. Now I don't know which one is which here, but it's just general pictures about how the wheat stalks are. So uh, in our lab we do the bioconversion. So first before we do that, we have to make sure that we have the right composition analysis. What are this made apart? And to this mix we added two BMR uh, lines because that's what we got from uh, uh, our Department of Agronomy, Kansas State University. There used to be a Professor Stagenbaum, so from his lab we got this. So uh, BMR as it's known, it's got uh, low lignin, it's obviously lignin content is less. The ACE Acid insoluble lignin is about 10, 9 percent, whereas in wheat straw and other grasses it's higher. This is typically the values. We vary a little bit on here, side, but this is what we got in the lab. Same goes for the sorghum bagasse. After the sugars have been extracted, what the bagasse is left. So we use that feedstock too. <coughs> when you do a conversion, this is you take your biomass, you do the pretreatment because I told you we need to do the pretreatment because you have to take care, you have to remove the lignin, make sure the enzymes are uh, attacking the fiber and then you release the sugar. So after the pretreatment, uh, this is the concentration of sugars you get and then uh, then you ferment that and you get ethanol. So about 50 percent, we're getting the yields pretty much same, about 50 percent is what it is. But then the productivity kind of drops down. But what is interesting is those uh, lines, sorghum lines where the BMR, uh, uh, the BMR line sorghum, the lignin content was less, we thought the sugar yield should be higher. But on the contrary, we're getting lower sugars compared to wheat stock. That means there's a whole lot going into it, not just the lignin content. And so that's, I was talking to Dr. Srinivas' uh, group, I was telling the lignin also plays an important role. Uh, so the quality of lignin is very important. So in other words, you can't just take it like a blank approach and say that if lignin is less, then that will help you. Because you've got to see what the composition changes. And we are doing some studies to understand at a structural level what this lignin is and what are the various components which uh, affect the fermentation. So it's possible that there could be some inhibitory products which are coming along and that's affecting the lignin. So that's once one project, uh, as I was coming here, we're writing a manuscript on that, but, but there's still a lot more work to do that. And in that sense, uh, the, the new project which I'm going to get uh, associated with Ecrisat, like I'm, I'm going to the PI from the US side and Dr. Srinivas from here, we're going to try different PMR lines the sorghum, and also going to use a regular energy sorghum as the control. And the location plays a big thing. And it's not just I go in Kansas and I do a study and I think that's, that's universal. You can't do that. You have to do the effect location, environment, and uh, the different lines. So that's going to be an elaborate study. So we're uh, anxiously looking forward to the study because the result is very important. And uh, so we've already done some work, but that's just preliminary. What I'm presenting is just preliminary. Another project from USDA we had was like when you pelletize this biomass. So pelletizing it's like you take a raw biomass here and this is unpelleted biomass. So one of the challenges of this lignocellulosic ethanol is the bulk density. So what it means is like this biomass is so loose, bulk density is about one-fourth that of grain biomass. So that's why if you have to transport the same quantity of biomass, you need four times the transportation capability because the bulk density is one-fourth of that. So what the, the solution is to densify this biomass. So one way you can do that is to pellet them. So when you pellet them, the bulk density goes up on average about 20 to 30 percent uh, increase. And so then the transportation cost comes down. So you are transporting more energy per unit volume of trucking. So we did some studies where we took uh, uh, biomass and then we ground them and then we pretreatment them. And then we took the same biomass, pelleted them, and then uh, we ground the pelleted biomass and we pretreated the pelleted biomass. So different combination of this biomass. So we did for four different biomass samples. And then again, very busy slide, I don't want to walk you through it, but I uh, just want to tell you the compositional kind of doesn't change much, uh, both between the raw and the pelleted. But when you do the pretreatment, then the composition changes, obviously, because uh, when you do the pretreatment, you're going to lose some carbon, either in form of, uh, uh, if you do an acid base, then you lose uh, hemicellulose, but if you do an alkali, then you lose lignin, so, and also the loss of biomass. So composition changes. This is what you get here, and this is the glucose, glucan and the xylan and the lignin. Part of it. So we, we did an elaborate study on this uh, pelleted biomass. Uh, 
Okay, there was one slide I missed out. Okay, anyway. Okay, there was another slide I had, I'm sorry, it's not showing up, basically that had uh, very interesting results when you pelletize uh, how it had an effect on bio conversion. Just to verbally tell you what it does is when you pelletize the biomass, you're not only increasing the bulk density, but uh, what we also found was the ethanol yield, I mean the glucose yield, the amount of quantity of glucose increased when you pelletized. So that's a twofold advantage we had when we pelletized it. And the reason is again, pelleting is a kind of pretreatment process, so the sugar uh, is, is kind of an, uh, when it goes through this pelleted process, then the sugars were getting more released. So I wanted to show that result, but it's not showing up. But uh, this is a very interesting study, and we published a paper on this, and got a lot of calls and a lot of people showing interest in okay, because all this time they were only focusing on pelleting as a pretreatment method, but we showed conclusively that it also helps in the sugar yield and ethanol formation. So that's what we did. And uh, to wrap up on this cellulose to uh, ethanol from cellulose, we have four major bottlenecks. So I was telling you earlier that the reason why we are falling behind on the mandates is because you have to make sure that all these four bottlenecks are met. First and foremost is the feedstock, the gathering and the transportation itself. There's not even one good method of doing it. There's a lot of research going into it and people are trying different ways to harvest and pelletize and increase the bulk density. But uh, there's no shortcut sure and it has to be energy uh, less intensive and cost less in intensive. So both play an important role. And once you get a biomass, this pretreatment is a very energy intensive mechanical, thermomechanical process, thermomechanical or thermochemical process. So you got to use a lot of chemicals, a lot of energy to break down this complex biomass into simple fibers. And then you add your enzymes and then the enzymes, uh, it's a whole lot of different enzymes you add for cellulosic biomass. Uh, corn to ethanol, you only add two enzymes and they cost less than two, two or three pennies per gallon of ethanol. Whereas this costs about 50 cents, so that's a lot of money just going in for enzymes. So that's the story. And then the fermentation is a little bit more complex. Uh, grain to ethanol, you just add yeast culture and you get your ethanol. Whereas the cellulosic, you've got to add in culture, which not only utilizes your C5 sugars, but also your uh, C6, but also your C5 sugars. And uh, I know, again, Dr. Srinivas is working with the University of Florida, lowering grammar developed a strain. But those are all very good at the lab scale. But when it comes to really industrial scale, they're having some issues. So we, we, we are still in very early stages on that. So in our lab, we've done some using Zymomonas, but uh, again, the yields are not very high. Uh, it's not able to have high concentration. So that's another challenge. But uh, we don't know what the effect it will have on downstream processing because there's a whole other issue. But this three itself is taking a lot of time. So that's where this cellulosic ethanol is. But uh, you have to deal with it and advances are happening. And then uh, there's a saying among, among our biochemical and the biofuels community that uh, asked when the cellulosic and all will take up, we say next five years. So the next five years keeps on coming. So we don't know when the end is. But finally, uh, 2014 is when they say the new ethanol plants based on cellulosic biomass are going to come into operation. So obviously there's something happening there, which is good for all of us. <coughs> so this way the cellulosic ethanol plants, how will it integrate with your existing plants? As I showed you earlier, there are about 200 ethanol plants. So when the cellulosic ethanol really takes off, uh, in the sense we all want it to take off, then all we do is that you have one stream of sugars coming from your starch or grain, and then from your ligneous cellulosic, then you're going to have some pretreatment and a different cellulosic uh, hydrolysis plant, and then the sugars, then this fermentation is going to be complex. So this is where the integration happens. In the same plant trying to do both the processes. So this is typically how it will be done. And then the lignin which is collected can be used in thermochemical conversion. Because sometimes people take the whole biomass and try to use it for thermochemical or, or pelleting or burning for power. I feel it's a loss of uh, carbon, a misutilization of carbon, because the fermentable sugars can get right through this biochemical pathway, but it's a non-fermentable part of the residue that you try to run through the thermochemical platform. And uh, it, uh, they also found studies that when you take your whole biomass and do this pyrolysis or uh, gasification, the quality of your bio oil, biochar, all that, they change because the sugars are there and uh, uh, this bio oil stability becomes an issue. So one way to do that is to take them, run them through the pre take out the sugars and then the residues, you can do all this stuff. And that's the hybrid process and I think that's the way it should be done in your lab. So again, uh, to elaborate this process, you have your different feedstocks coming in and uh, there's not even one feedstock which we should try to write through. We should try everything because it's always good to have a mix, just like the crude oil, which the uh, the hydro uh, the refineries process. 
the crude oil can come from anywhere, Indonesia, Venezuela, Middle East, whatever you pick. So they can't say that I can only grow, process Iranian crude or Indonesian crude and say we can't do that. That's not the way it's going to operate. So similarly, the feedstocks has to be operated from wherever it comes. So you take a feedstock, you can go through the biochemical platform, essentially a sugar platform and make your products, or you can run it through the thermochemical. But the good thing is to have a synergy between these two so that all every component of this feedstock is utilized in the right way and you end up with all the chemicals and materials. So that's what we want to do. I want to give a little overview of where all the different biofuels uh, technology are standing right now. Most of you heard about uh, ethanol, uh, both from grain and cellulosic. You might have heard of new molecules like biobutanol, but uh, there are a lot of other things going on. And uh, cellulosic ethanol already told you what the issues. So finding value for lignin is a huge thing because one-third carbon is about lignin. One-third of this feedstock is lignin. Unless you find value for it, uh, you're not going to be economically making any sense. So that's the first challenge here. And also fermentation and improvement of microorganism enzymes. So this is where this key R&D issue is for cellulosic ethanol. And other technologies like hydrogenated vegetable oil, uh, again, the feedstock flexibility and uh, using hydrogen for that is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, biomass to liquid direct diesel, which are going to other step. Uh, this you can do via thermochemical processing. But again, the catalyst you use, the energy and uh, the utilization of the heat which you generated, this is some of the technical challenges. And uh, then you have the algae-based biofuels. All of you have heard about the green algae. You squeeze it, you get your oil, and then process it. On paper, it's a wonderful technology. But again, the cost involved to make a gallon of this oil from algae is extremely high. The main reason is because uh, uh, the oil content on a dry weight basis may be high, but, but the algae has got a very lot of, uh, lot of water in it. So on that basis, it's very little. And then you have the separation and processing costs. So it doesn't end there. That's your algae oil. And then again, there's a lot of variation again among this algae team too, so it's difficult to know how it goes. Then you biomass directly to the gas, syngas. Uh, so again, the feedstock flexibility and the cleanup process, catalyst getting contaminated. So those are a lot of other issues. So this is where this is. And then your pyrolysis, which is when you do this same gasification by a uh, very low oxygen content, then it's called pyrolysis. So when you do that, you end up with uh, bio oil, and they, they thought bio oil is like uh, crude oil, and then you can start doing all of other stuff. But then it has got a lot of uh, residual sugars and uh, uh, very low pH. So the storability issues and uh, contamination issues kick in. So those are some of the issues you have to deal with. And then the catalyst, which is used because this biomass is variable. You know, there's a lot of things happening. It comes with some oxygen in it, so then this catalyst has to be designed differently than the way the hydrocarbons are done. So this is where the biofuels from other technologies are. But in the future, you have what is known as biorefining. And this is something which you might have heard people talk about, all the things you can do. So ideally, a plant should be such a way it uses multiple technologies for converting them. It can be thermochemical or it can be biochemical. It can use any kind of feedstocks, residues to commodity, residues to herbaceous, to woody biomass. Uh, again, the composition plays an important role. Then you have to specifically develop the technology which will help to cater to this and then you pretty much can make multiple products. So why you make multiple products? Because if you just ride along one product and something happens to that, then your whole business model falls apart. So if you have multiple products, suppose if you're doing good on the chemical side, then you can divert all your uh, carbon toward that and make more money. So that's the advantage of this uh, refinery concept. So that's how the, uh, the oil refineries work too. If the transportation fuel prices are hitting the roof, then they divert all their resources toward that. If the prices and transportation starts falling, they go towards the chemicals and plastics. That's all the mix and match. So we have to do that if you have to stay competitive with the existing model. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the fermentation. Like, you know, that's the heart of all this biochemical processing. You might have learned in your biochemistry classes what this fermentation is. But from process engineering point, we try to do the same fermentation process in a vessel. And when we do that, there's a whole lot of process engineering things uh, which needs to be considered. So we do this bioreactor operation either in the batch mode or fed batch continuous or in immobilized reactor form. I won't go into a lot of theory behind it, but uh, most of the bioprocessing projects or, or technologies use this batch process because it's easier we have for operating and uh, it's, uh, you don't need a whole lot of technical skills. So you just fill in the reactor, add your microbe, uh, you add your ingredients, sterilize it, add your microbe, run the reaction harvest it and you're done. So that's typically what the batch mode is. Most of the ethanol plants follow this. 
because they use uh, non-sterilized April mode, so it kind of helps them doing that. The three parameters we consider, again a little bit of theory I want to tell you, is first is the product yield. How much a product you can make per gram of your substrate? So most of the time uh, this is critical because that is inherent to the microbes, all this metabolic engineering and uh, sometimes even through process parameters you can increase the yield, but mostly it's inherent within the cell. It also depends on the stoichiometry. For example, ethanol you can only make 0.5 for every gram of glucose. That's the way the pathway is. You, know, you, you can't change it unless you tinker with the whole pathway and increase the yield. So that's a limit set by the process and stoichiometry. And the product concentration is how much of this product you can make per unit volume. So most of the time I've seen papers where people say that we're getting extremely high yield, but they're very silent on the concentration part. These two are extremely important because not only make high amount of a product per unit substrate you consume, but you also make more per unit volume so that in both accounts uh, you're scoring high. And then the final thing is more an economic term because you, how much product you make per liter per hour basis. So the time is money, so the shorter time you take to process to make the product of your interest, uh, the better for you. So again, uh, rule of thumb, all three uh, components you have to score high for any fermentation process to be successful. To give an example, the cellulosic ethanol, the yield you may get, you saw in the slides I showed, we're hitting closer to the theoretical yield, 0.49. So, but you can't just stop the story there. The concentration, even though we try high substrate, high solid fermentation, we are still getting only 4% concentration, and that's not enough. But it's 40 grams per liter, it's not enough. Uh, Grain to ethanol, you get about 15 percent, so that is 150 grams, that's good. But 4 percent is not enough. That's where the cellulosic ethanol is stuck. And productivity, again, rule of thumb, you should get 1 gram per liter per hour. So anything higher than that is considered to be economically viable. So these things you have to keep in mind when you do a fermentation. So we do this in our lab, and uh, I just want to give a couple of examples on the building block chemicals. Uh, we talked about fuels, but I want to tell you that Department of Energy identified in 04 some of these chemicals which can be done via this fermentation or biochemical. So once you get your sugars, it can come from your grain or it can come from your biomass, these sugars can be fermented and you can make any other product. So we have worked with different cultures and I worked on succinic acid and 3-hydroxypropionic uh, acid which is also lactic acid and other chemicals here. Once you make this platform chemical, then you can convert that and make other useful product. So in our lab, we are focused on three advanced biofuels. And basically these are the platform chemicals which are made from fermentation and then you convert that and make into fuels. So three different entities are supporting. First one is the butanediol. Uh, U.S. Navy is supporting this project first. And here uh, we they've made this butanediol from uh, sugars, biomass sugars. And we have the, the right culture and we have the right fermentation process to make that. So we already have this technology. So in this new project I'm going to work with uh, Icrisat. Uh, we're going to make this butanediol with this BMR lines and see what the effects are. We're already making it from uh, the, the energy sorghum and wheat straw, but we want to try on this BMR and see the effect. Because like I told you earlier, the lower lignin, the better it is, but in the case of ethanol, it was not helping. Maybe with this butanediol uh, microbe, it could be a different story, so we need to check. Story doesn't end there. Once you make the butanediol, uh, it's, an, it's used as a solvent. You can combine with succinic acid and make polybutylene succinate, which is a wonder polymer or you can make uh, butanediol itself, uh, you can use and make a lot of it. So this, that's the reason why these are known as platform chemicals. Once you make them, use them as a platform, you can make any products you want. But with this uh, Navy project, we're converting this butanediol into butanes, uh, which can act as dopping biofuels. So that's the way the new advanced biofuels are going. Similarly, the other project to have, the recent project from this Biomass Research and Development Initiative, USDA, we've got a big grant, a part of the grant. So we're making this microbial fatty acids. So these are free fatty acids and uh, they were engineered in E. coli which can make this get secreted into the tank and this free fatty acids can be converted into drop-in biofuels. And this can go into higher end jet fuels or it can go into uh, transportation fuels depending on the market mix you want. And again, uh, I recently again I started working with another group company which is making this farnesine. Farnesine is a SSQ terpene, C15 class. Kerosene comes close to it. So the farnesine can be made in plants, so they are re-engineering these plants, both sorghum lines and sugarcane lines. Uh, I don't understand the science behind that, but they do that. And my job is to extract this farnesine and then convert it to farnesine. Uh, so basically you hydrogenate this and then you make it, and that, that can be used as a drop-in fuels. So this, there's a company called Emirates in California which is already doing this, but they're using microbial cultures to do it. So microbial culture again runs into fermentation, all that. Here, this company Chromatin is trying to do this in plants. 
And once they do it, all it takes is extract and do it. So it's a good model, but we are in very early stage as far as the yields go. So this is another important advanced biofuel we're working on. So I just want to give a little overview. There are a lot of other examples, but these are the three new molecules we're working on, which we feel tremendous potential as we move forward uh, when we start working on these different projects. So uh, other than that, uh, in our lab, we're also working on this D minus lactic acid. Most of you must be familiar with uh, regular L lactic acid, which can use lactobacillus, but this D has got special properties. So we use, uh, this is again a uh, DOE funded project, we're using this paper sludge. So after the paper, uh, the, the pulp, I mean, after, once the fiber goes through the paper industry, the pulp is recovered, what is left over is the sludge. Uh, all, all the sugar, I mean, all the solid particles, the clay material, all the things combined together. Um, very difficult to dispose it off, so they're disposed as landfills, so we take this feedstock and we developed a new microbe, uh, Delbrucki. We engineered this so we can utilize both the sugars. And you know, we ran the fermenter, and then we want to make this d lactic acid. So this is just a fermentation profile, how it looks. So we're heating about 60 grams per liter, which is pretty good. Um, and then once we convert that, and within a fairly short time, so we published this in bioprocess and biosystems engineering. So this is the way to go. And one of my grad students is working on uh, this oligenous yeast, which essentially means oil bearing yeast, so a special class of yeast. So they produce in single cell oils and they can go as high as 70 percent, 90 percent of these triacylglycerides, what is known as TAG. And once you make them, so once you make them yeast cells, the existing ethanol plants can make them too. So we're working on this product. So once you make this, it can also utilize both the sugars and uh, this is a flat form chemical. So once you make this uh, product, TAGs, you can convert them into biofuels, you can send them to cosmetics, you can go into the detergent lubricant industry, are you going to farm So there's a lot of applications. That's the future. That's the way it's going to be. You make a platform chemical, and then that can be used for making products which can be used for different uh, industry. So in that way, you have multiple product streams, multiple revenue streams. So we are trying to target on making this platform chemical using yeast, and once we make that, then we're making all these products. So that's the latest thing what we're going on. And we're going to try the same bug on the BMR lines too, the sugars derived from this BMR lines. So it's a two-year project, so we've got a little time. And we got a very good start because we already have the technologies worked out in our lab. All we have to do is test it out with different biomass sources. So that's where we are. And uh, I got several more examples, but I just wanted to show you some of the five different molecules we are working in our lab. And uh, whatever the story is, you know, we are so focused on the science conversion, all that, but uh, the buzzword is the sustainability. Is this process sustainable? Now, the technologies which were developed in the last century, they were not that focused on the sustainability aspect. They're mostly on the economic side. If it works, fine, go for it, otherwise leave it. Or if it's working economic, turn a blind eye towards the environmental and the social aspects. But now the biofuel industry is under the full glare of the entire world, not just the practitioners, but also the uh, NGOs, the, um, all the various entities. So if your technology has to be successful, it has to meet all these three criteria, and it has to be sustainable. It's only then it's going to be accepted in the market. I wish this was true a century ago, then we wouldn't have had the issues we have right now, pollution and the emissions issues and all that. So you have to make sure that the employment, land issues, uh, food security, these things are met before we can take off. And then it meets all the emissions requirement, doesn't mess up the soil, water, and the biodiversity, and then come to the economic and make sure that uh, you're, you're making profit, makes the financing aspect very uh, lucrative so that you can raise loans from the bank. So it's a whole complex issue. But only when you meet all these three, then you come into the sustainability aspect. So that's where another thing you have to take into account. So the goal is like, you know, what is the motivation? Why, why are we doing all that? One is, of course, I told you the money aspect. But the uh, motivation for this bioeconomy is the environmental quality. And that's for sure. Uh, we are messed up our environment based on property. So we ought to make sure that all is met. And then for, for some countries which are relying a lot on the imports of this foreign oil, and India is one example, uh, it's good to have a program where you have at least part of your economy based on these domestic resources. We have to do it. I mean, in, in the sense, like, don't just follow what others do it, but we've got to have our own independent policy. And it's not just a scientist in me telling this, but a policy maker in me telling too. Uh, it makes more rational sense to kind of have your own self-independent process. It can be a mix of the total energy. It may not totally replace, but a good mix so that, you know, that at least gives the leverage so that we're not caught into the geopolitics of imports and exports. And finally, the rural development. And I mean, just to quote Mahatma Gandhi, he used to say India is land of villages. Uh, he wanted it that way so that the population stays in the rural side. 
but now we know what has happened. I mean, the, most of the population is moving from other parts to the cities, and you have these mega cities, and mega cities become even mega, and that's creating all kinds of issues. So try to focus on rural development. I showed you the slide where the ethanol plants are closer to where the crops are. Uh, you can kind of do that too. I mean, that, in that way, you, you don't have you don't have this issue of migration within the country from rural to the urban and a whole lot of other issues. But this has an criteria for that to meet that. So that's what I would say. So to end my talk, I would highlight a few points. First is integrated biorefineries. Uh, it's not just enough to take uh, one feedstock and make one molecule. You can never be in business. The only way to go forward is to have an integrated biorefinery, which handles broader powder mix and good cost efficiency and ob obviously sustainable. So that's a pipe dream, but that's the goal. You got to meet that if you want to be uh, successful. And this integration can involve any platform. Sometimes we get so attached to the platform. For example, I work on biochemical. Uh, that's not the be all and end all. You have to be open for other ideas from other platforms. And integration involves all these different platforms. That's the way you're going to do it. And some of this thing, we try to reinvent the wheel, uh, which we don't have to. The oil and the chemical industry or other processing industry has already been there on for more than 100 years. They know how to handle the global markets. They know how to handle the supply chain. Uh, they know the operational efficiency is all optimized. Why reinvent the wheel? So all you have to do is make your product so that you can fit into this existing system. That's why the platform chemicals. So make lactic acid, butyrin dial, all that. Try to make sure that you make that because the chemistry involved in bioconversion is amazing. So that part you do as part of your fermentation and then the resulting molecules, let that get integrated in the existing chemical industry. So that's the way it should be done. And the raw material cost, that is the feedstock cost, should become marginal in terms of economic uh, value. You can't have an industry where the cost of raw material is more than 15% of the total power cost. That happens then you're, what, you, you are what, you are kind of susceptible to the variation in those prices. And that's what happened with the grain to ethanol industry. In US itself, in between 2006 to 8, more than 80 to 100 ethanol plants went belly up. The reason is like they started off very fast, it's something like the uh, similar to the Californian gold boom. So they want to start off this, make a quick buck, and they raise money through high rates and all that. And then the cost of this raw material shot the roof. Uh, the price per bushel went from $3 to $7 to $8, and then no economy can sustain that. So they all went belly up. So you have to be careful. When you base your project, you have to make sure that the raw material cost doesn't affect your overall process. So, Well, I, with these thoughts, I want to thank you again for your time. Appreciate you all listening to me in spite of all your busy schedules. But uh, just wanted to quickly share with some of the potential out there. And uh, entity like Equisad will play a very, very important in this role in this new bioeconomy because you'll be supplying the feedstock. You'll be positioning the feedstock and telling the right quality thing. And then it gets integrated with people like us, the process engineers, so we can make the right kind of product or product mix. So I want to acknowledge again some of the uh, people, all the funding agencies, and then important thing are the grad students. They do the work so that people like me can come and talk here. So I appreciate truly those students. And then, of course, the other centers for funding this project. Thank you again for your time. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Yes, sir. Right. 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 Yeah. So what is the Yeah, very good question. Now again, like I told you, it's a mix of uh, technology, mix of energy platforms. Uh, the fundamental mistake we do is like once a new idea or new technology comes, we want to divert all our raw material resources to that and then try to see if we can do that. To answer the question, I would say, sir, we've got to first have to do a very fundamental evaluation of what is available and what needs to go. We have to meet our primary needs, food and other things. But there's still a lot of residue biomass, a lot of resources left. Uh, for example, Igrisat, you know, you're looking at a semi-arid tropical plant. So that's an excellent example. And you try to raise crops specifically for biofuels in that land which is underutilized or misutilized. And when you do that, you know, that may meet at the most 5 or 10 percent of your total energy mix. That's okay. You're still at least 5 or 10% away from importing oil. So that would be the right way. And this would call for an, for an understanding and uh, involvement of people from every walk of life, not just the scientists, not just the conversion people. 
peace talk people, so everyone has to come together and talk through it. So it can be done. That's my fundamental belief. And I've seen that happen in other parts of the world. Uh, and India can do it too. I mean, as far as ingenuity goes, I think nobody can beat us. That's for sure. But it's just the utilization of the resources. Right. Or will you argue? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sugar cane, yeah, again, we do have quite a bit of sugar cane, and there's quite a bit of bagasse which comes through it. Um, again, processing of that and to make fuels like ethanol, maybe not the model, because then you're competing with the a, with a regular ethanol industries. You know? I was just hearing a story where you go ahead and set up your distillery based on sweet sorghum. And then you can't hit the margins because, you know, the regular market is. So then you've got to pick a molecule other than ethanol or, or you've got to have a different economic model so that this, you allow a little time for this to grow and mature. We are trying to compete with this uh, existing uh, chemical industry which have been around for, I mean, decades. And they're fully uh, depreciated plants, so you can't beat them on price. The only way you can beat them is on different product. So, yeah, you can. I mean, there's no easy answer to it, but I have a feeling that it's important to Think outside the box, come with a specific technology and specific product, and in that environment, try to grow. And it takes a little while. There's going to be growing pains, but I think you can do it. I'm optimistic on that. <laughs> yeah. Even from an Indian perspective. Yes, sir? There was an issue raised there about the cost of raw material. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and to, of course, the balance of energy use in producing the feedstock. Right. Mm -hmm. If, uh, say, small-scale uh, processing of uh, this home waste, mm -hmm. home waste, biomass uh, mm -hmm. from home waste. Uh, have you worked on that? Okay. So domestic waste and all that, how that affect? Yeah, I mean, again, the raw material cost, when I meant, it's not, it includes a tipping fee, it's a processing cost, so the whole lot of things. Before it enters the reactor, how much cost goes into it? So. Again, we talk about municipal solid waste and other domestic waste, and we think that's the way to go. But then there's a lot of cost involved before it's brought to the processing site because they're diluted, and then they have a lot of suspended solids and other things which are not fermentable. So you have to separate them, or they'll ride along your reactor. That'll take up some volume. So you have to be careful when you draw a line. Uh, even though you're talking about home waste, and from a net energy point of view, maybe that makes sense. But from a processing point of view, the amount of carbon present that's what dictates the whole process. So if that carbon is not there, fermentable carbon is not there, then again, you're stuck with a lot of solids of not much value. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, the, the concept of biofuels mm -hmm. for a country like India, uh, which is initialist you know, in, the, in, the, in the West, uh, started with the grain-based feedstocks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right. uh, this is now known that it's mm -hmm. not sustainable. Right. So now mm -hmm. it's because probably uh, even the, um, the world may not be, may not be able to even meet the, the food requirements right. from the mm -hmm. existing grain stocks. So forget about mm -hmm. diverting them to the biofuels. Now right. we're shifting to more towards non-edible right. uh, non mm -hmm. biomass. Right. But again, uh, for a country like India, most of the non-edible biomass is already tied Use up, water. Tied, up mm -hmm. tied up, with the mm -hmm. animal industry mm -hmm. uh, as, as a food source. Mm -hmm. So there is not so much scope to, to mm -hmm. divert. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you really actually, actually analyze the availability mm -hmm. of non-edible biomass for the biofuel industry, mm -hmm. particularly for a country like India, there is limited scope. In addition to that, mm -hmm. you talked about the sustainability mm -hmm. in your in your model. More right. Mm -hmm. You see, a, a lot of this non-edible non biomass must be returned to the soil mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to maintain. Of course, mm -hmm. you are a chemical engineer, but mm -hmm. from an agricultural perspective, mm -hmm. though, it's mm -hmm. very important for the soil quality uh, and, to yeah. to maintain the soil carbon levels and the uh, organic matter levels mm -hmm. in the soil, which are rapidly depleting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which affects the long-term sustainability of right. our system. So again, that issue, that issue comes up. Right. Comes up. It, it may not come up right away because mm -hmm. a lot of people are it's very important to think through. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. quite excited about using um, non-edible biomass, mm -hmm. uh, but again, it would it would 
come up very very soon mm-hmm. probably a couple of years from now right it may not be in any, uh, it may not be in the western countries where mm-hmm. non edible biomass is not used for, as mm-hmm. animal feed mm-hmm. but in a country it's already used right. in like mm-hmm. in india mm-hmm. but even in other countries uh, in the western countries uh, which mm-hmm. is still uh, not used non edible mm-hmm. biomass but again when it comes to sustain, sustainability and returning this biomass to mm-hmm. the soil mm-hmm. that becomes an issue in the near future mm-hmm. i just i think uh, some of these things would become uh, i think um, store stoppers yeah yeah issue yeah, yeah. But because ultimately the availability of raw material mm-hmm. is the driving force for exactly this. Mm-hmm. if the raw material disappears mm-hmm. because of other competing needs mm-hmm. then the whole industry will collapse yeah so i um, thank you for the comments because you know that's definitely has to be considered and uh, again uh with my limited understanding of the whole thing it's a whole complex issue a lot of things involved uh, why us is the only country where to a large extent they still are continuing with this grain to ethanol process because excess grain so from the local economy point of view there are a lot of corn a lot of sorghum and some of these crops like you know either they dump it or you know they try to misutilize it yeah uh, uh, it's a political issue right mm-hmm. people say that okay you know us has a lot of grain mm-hmm. excess grain they also have an obligation to the rest of the world right. to share this grain right right no the <laughs> thing is you know yeah again we're getting into this policy issues and uh, not at a level where i can answer though that but the the comment because you know i talked to this uh, uh, renewable fuel association in, in us and asked them this question like they say that they've been doing this corn to ethanol for a lot of decades nobody asked them it's only when they bumped it up and when it became an uh, kind of thing which everyone wanted to replicate even countries like philippines india and other ones Uh, then it is not going to work i agree with you completely we, our, our populations are different our needs are different uh, they say that you know it's been working in our model and what do you do with the grain again it's a supply demand economics policy issues and all that but i made a comment that it's already been saturated what they can do with grain to ethanol is already been done so they only say that you know after taking care of all the needs of the domestic as well as export markets still they are having a lot to burn and most of this corn are again not of very high quality I mean, the, some of these corn which are used in ethanol plants are different. They're specifically meant; for, they're known as fuel ethanol corn, a grain for ethanol crop. But the important question is: you are talking about the residues and other things. Yeah, again, I agree because you know, uh, again, in the U.S. itself, like state, University like Iowa State and other, they've done some studies where they pondered exactly how much of the crop residue should be recycled back and how much. So that billion ton study which I showed you, that may or may not have accounted for that. But there have been some revised studies and they pondered that. you got to do a realistic study of what is available I mean, even before we go ahead and start uh, putting up these plants for various reasons political economical regional issues uh, social issues but you have to realistic um, evaluation of how much feed stocks available and after taking into account the amount which goes into the soil it goes in for uh, feed industry and all that and then realistically look into that but i still feel there's there's quite a bit of biomass available and again i'm telling you like you know even if you uh use up all what is available biomass at the most you'll meet 2 or 3% of your transportation need so it's not going to change in a very significant way uh it's gathered a lot of uh, attention of various stakeholders uh which really really doesn't amount to much but where the game changer is going to be is when you divert this carbon freely available fermentable carbon to other value added products like the drop in fuels now those will make margins like for example jet fuels aviation fuels and you have the technology which can do that and that's where our lab is focused we are not doing ethanol because i completely agree with you that may not be the way to go yeah, yeah i would like to take opportunity actually to compliment uh, pravin sir sir because i am also working on biofuels so dr subbara has pointed about the indian situation yeah. because you see there are two different reports uh, which are funded by government of india through tifac dst and another by indian institute of uh, science uh, bangalore okay and both stay close to there are uh, close to 550 million tons of agriculture residues that are available for use okay on the other side from the planning commission government of india there is a shortage of 35% forage in this country okay uh, yeah one says it is this one yeah, yeah another there is a shortage but for example you cannot use dried sugarcane leaves 
for meeting the fodder okay and when you are using the combine in wheat and rice harvesting you cannot use the whatever the store that is available in the field for feeding the cattle so it's where no it is situation and location dependent and the process you are really using and all this you needs to count for example in case of cotton stalks no you can use for diverse uses rather than burning that is the practice in majority of the cotton growing regions okay and same case applies uh, for sorghum where we are promoting sorghum is no when you are not when the <coughs> land is kept fallow and uh, Uh, and it is highly saline where uh, no other commercial crop can be taken up you can promote this crop in a semi arid tropics that's where we can make use of uh, the biomass because of its resilience to different conditions so we need to draw parallels and it is a condition and a location specific all this will happen with the support uh, suitable policy support from the local governments yeah. we now the maybe dr rakesh uh, thanks very much for such an interesting presentation thank you sir. Yeah, yeah. it was a pleasure hearing you um i am particularly curious uh, about uh, the bmr uh, lines which right. you mentioned in your presentation um uh, i am wondering if you uh, just used sorghum bmr lines or you also expanded your basket to uh, wheat uh, i'm sorry um uh, maize and uh, palm millet bmr lines, lines. No. yeah we the, this bmr stock we i was just setting up my lab and i was looking around for feed stocks and then uh, it was no project per se but Uh, this professor had this uh, BMR samples, and he particularly said this has got low lignin in it, so go try and evaluate the biomass. So it's not a complete comprehensive study. So that's why I'm not drawing big conclusion. What he did do is he did throw up some surprising results, like you know, low lignin doesn't necessarily mean it will translate into high uh, sugars and high ethanol. But uh, that's what we're going to do with uh, Dr. Srinivas. Like he's going to supply a whole broad spectrum of uh, BMR, primarily with sorghum. Uh, but we're not tried with wheat and other things. But yeah. if you happen to get yeah. those lines, it will be more than exactly. happy. Just in case you would be interested in pearl millet, we can supply you. Uh, we'll appreciate that. Five yeah. lines uh, with different BMR. That'll be an excellent study because those are the kind of things. Again, to answer your question, sir, because this will have a specific growing conditions, and if folks like you can develop and want to evaluate, and if thing works, that should be the model we have to follow. I mean, that's uh, th those studies are extremely critical. And again, location plays a role. I may do this study in U.S. and then uh, you can't use that result because it varies. The, it's not just the composition; it's also the quality, the chemistry, which goes into the feed stock. That plays a role. So you have to evaluate that. And since our lab is set up to do that, I think we're more than happy to evaluate those slides. You also made a very interesting comment on gluten diol. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So you think uh, there is some kind of uh, interaction of uh, BMR lines with? Uh, We need to study that. That'll be interesting to see because this Klebsiella, what the bug which we are going to use, mm -hmm. uh, we, we want to see how that will take. Because the thing we have to notice when you do this pre-treatment, when you deconstruct this biomass, it's not just the sugars which come along. The whole lot of other entities which ride along, the chemicals, the acetyl linkages, the the phenolic compounds, the sugars which get degraded. So different bugs have got different tolerance, resistance to this uh, inhibitors, as we call them. So we we saw that with Klebsiella, it was not getting any. And even the things like acetic acid and other things, we tried right along, it was able to take it. So I want to try this in BMR lines and see, because basically the quality of lignin is the one which is playing a role. So we want to see how that will affect our fermentation. You found any kind of linkages with uh, C5 sugars like uh, xylose and arabinose? Yeah. This this bug can utilize both. So that's the reason. Okay. Most of all the new three new technologies we are working on, we want to make sure that it utilizes both sugars. Otherwise, you're economically, you're not viable. All right. uh, because that's the thing about cellulose ethanol. It just uses C sugars. C6 sugars, and you can be in business with just with that. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good question. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, regarding cellulose to ethanol, you told that you are going to improve microorganism to produce yeah. high enzymes. Yeah. So you are going to bioengineer the microbes. In order yeah. To that's. I'm not. We're not doing it in our lab. I don't want to get into that because there already been so much work has been done. Because DOE has funded so many labs. For developing microbial strains which can utilize both the sugars, but uh, most of the strains are kept highly proprietary, or uh, the results are bizarre. Like we did try one strain from a lab, uh, which said that this can utilize both xylose and glucose. But when we tried that in a lab, it didn't work. We tried it several times. So uh, that's that's a good area to work in, but we are staying away from that because we don't see much value in that. So we're trying to get into the chemicals and other biofuels. But the recent report, I think last month, hmm. says only. Where they have designed the xanthomonas psoriasis mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to produce higher amount of cellulose. What mm -hmm. they are doing, they are doing, they are mutating uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
a team responsible for the production mm -hmm. and then they are designing a vector where they have where they have a, a strategic promoter they mm -hmm. have used lag promoters okay and mm -hmm. then in the wild genotype it was producing 1 mg per liter mm -hmm. and now it is producing uh, 25 to 30 mg per liter yeah that's two percent it's still not enough as I told you, we, we, we went up to 4% and still it's not available. But that's a good science. I mean, at least if you're going from 1 to 25, as you said, that's, that's a good, good percentage increase. But unfortunately, that still doesn't help economically. So the point I'm making is, yeah, there's still a lot of advances going. And it's possible that there's a, there could be some companies which already have the strains. They don't want to disclose it. And because uh, as I was telling you, there are finally going to be two or three ethanol plants uh, which are going to come into mainstream uh, production. So uh, I talk to them, they never say anything. They won't tell either way. But all they say is if you have a proprietary strain, which can do all this. So, but good attempt. I mean, at least I appreciate you trying to follow the science and see what's going on in this. But uh, our lab is just getting into this metabolic engineering. We're not, uh, we're not trained to do that, but we're doing good things on the other side, the lactic acid and uh, oleaginous yeast side. Thanks. There are none. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah, <coughs> yeah you are already okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Praveen Vadlani, for the excellent lecture and uh, the sojourn you have taken for the last uh, 65 minutes uh, in the world of hydrocarbons. So <coughs> let us give another round of a big applause to our esteemed speaker. Thank you.